You guys are an enthusiastic bunch today. Let's go to Psalm chapter 84. One of my favorite psalms. Come on, bro. Psalm chapter 84. We'll read beginning here in verse 1. It says, How lovely is your dwelling place, Lord Almighty! My soul yearns, even faints, for the courts of the Lord. My heart and my flesh cry out for the living God. Even the sparrow has found a home, and the swallow a nest for herself, where she may have her young, a place near your altar. Lord Almighty, my King and my God, blessed are those who dwell in your house. They are ever praising you. And I hope you guys are excited to be in the house of the Lord today. Not to be in a 15th floor ballroom in downtown Boston, but to be amongst the community of the believers of God. Because that is where the house of God is. You know, it says that the writer, he says, my soul yearns and faints for the Lord. I hope you guys had an awesome quiet time today. I sure did. Uh, Right now, I have the privilege of living right next to UMass Boston on the water. And uh, some people say my neighborhood is ghetto. Uh, They're just hating. They're mad because I'm on the water and they're not. But I love going down there and just spending time praying to God. And I I look forward to it. You know, some people were talking about how they feel really tired today because they lost an hour of sleep. I I didn't notice. I, I I went to bed super excited to wake up and spend time with God in the morning. So if you're at a place right now where it's just hard to wake up and read your Bible and it's just a little difficult to spend time in prayer, I don't relate with you right now. It's just not where I'm at at this time. I, I, I love spending time devoted to being close to God. Amen. Keep reading in verse 5. It says, Blessed are those whose strength is in you, whose hearts are set on pilgrimage. As they pass through the valley of Baca, they make it a place of springs. The autumn rains also cover it with pools. They go from strength to strength till each appears before God in Zion. It says, blessed are those who find their strength in God. Meaning not from themselves, but they go to God and that's where they get their strength. And then it talks about pilgrims. When I think of pilgrims, I think of guys in funny hats, like belt buckles on the front and they're eating turkey and stuff like that. You know, those pilgrims, these were people who were a part of the church in England. They were called separatists because they wanted to be separate from the church of England. And then they were called Puritans because they believed that the church dogma, the church doctrine had been corrupted by traditions of men. And they wanted to purely follow the Bible. So they moved to the Netherlands and they couldn't really hack it there. So instead they funded this expedition where they were going to get on this boat. Now we call it the Mayflower. And they went on a voyage and a great crusade to a new land where they could worship God with what they thought was truth and spirit. And truly, this is our story. We are pilgrims on a great crusade, not to go conquer the Holy Land in Jerusalem from Muslim people or anything crazy like that. We're actually doing something way crazier. We're on a crusade to reclaim Eden. We're trying to restore a biblical Christianity where we can follow God according to the regulations that he has given from his word. It says they pass through a valley of Baca. The valley of Baca was like this wasteland. And they say they make it a place of springs. That's like going into Dorchester and starting a fruitful Bible talk. It's like going to the middle of nowhere up in Portland, Maine, where surely no life can be. And you go and you're fruitful there. It's like going down where the roadies live in Providence, Rhode Island. And they have strange names for cities. They meet in Pawtuckets. It's the Valley of Baca. And yet life can be there. And it says they go from strength to strength until they meet God one day. We learn here who gets to meet God and how they get there. The strong and they come in with strength. You know, in the song that Emeka sang, Crossing the Jordan, this was symbolic of death. They were going to cross the Jordan and then they were going to enter into the promised land. And for us, crossing the Jordan is our death as we go into heaven. And yet in that time, there were two million Israelites. How many from the first generation made it across the Jordan into the promised land? Only two. Joshua and Caleb. And as Caleb would describe himself at 80 years old, 
maybe like around the age of our brother Anthony Franklin over there. And at 80 years old, he says, my strength and my vigor has not worn down. And what we learn is that the longer you are a disciple, you're not supposed to become decrepit. You're not supposed to become weak. You're only supposed to get stronger and stronger as you see the day approaching. One quote that I love. It's been said that Christianity is a marathon, so you should pace yourself. I fundamentally disagree. I say you start as fast as you can and you gradually speed up from there. The title of the lesson is Strength to Strength. Because without strength from God, you won't make it. And my friend, if you want to get to heaven, there's only one way you're getting there, and that is strong. And I have three points for you today. Please go to Matthew chapter 11. Point number one, strengthened by commitment. Strengthened by commitment. Matthew chapter 11, we're going to read here in verse 28. A deceptively encouraging scripture. You'll see what I mean. Matthew 11, verse 28. It says, Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. It gives you the warm and fuzzies a little bit, right? This is very subtly a high commitment scripture. And it has to do with the terminology. What does Jesus say you are supposed to take upon you? His yoke. yoke. What does that mean? Yeah, a lot of people don't know what they're talking about when they say this. Like, like they'll talk about like eggs. And they'll start explaining like the spiritual meaning. You guys ever listen to people just start explaining stuff and they're just like way off? And you just let them finish because it's funny? Yeah, I got a phone call on Friday, and this guy was, uh, he's like from a different church. I guess my phone number's on the church website, so people will call me kind of regularly to argue with me. I don't know why. And sometimes they'll like record the argument without my knowledge and post it on YouTube, because I like, they, they want to like debate with me, and so like I fall for it, and I argue with them. And, they, and then people will post it, like send it to me, like, did you see this? Like they posted a conversation with you on YouTube. I'm like, well, I don't know why they would do that. I smoked that guy in the debate. Maybe he edited it. Like, I wouldn't post that if I were him. But this guy called me, and he was asking me, he's like, do you worship God the Mother? I was like, I don't know what that is. And he was like, well, I mean, the Bible says that everything is made obvious. And so we have God the Father. And then we have God the Son. So do you worship God the Mother? I was like, I don't think that's a thing. And then he, he's like, I was like, please enlighten me. Please explain. He just talked for like 30 minutes explaining like a character that's not in the Bible anywhere. And about why we should worship it. And I just, I, I enjoy listening to people say stuff like that. So anyway, uh, the yoke has nothing to do with eggs. What is a yoke? This is an ancient piece of farming equipment. It's essentially handcuffs for your neck. So what you do, you don't have a tractor. So you take two oxen or two mule or something like that. And you put a yoke on their necks. And what the yoke does is it makes it so that they, like just imagine like this like wooden stock type of thing going around the neck. And then it attaches it to the other oxen. It creates synergy. So now they have to move in the same direction at the same speed. So what Jesus is inviting you to do is to come on in and handcuff your neck to his. What does that mean? Well, in one sense, it's very easy. But only if you're going in the same direction as him at the same speed as him. So imagine like you're you're yoked to a much stronger beast than you. And you really want to go this way, but he's going that way. How's that going to feel? Yeah, you, like you ever like walk your dog and they just don't understand the concept of like it's going to hurt your neck if you just keep rushing forward? Like that's us a lot of times with God. And we want to be yoked to him, but we want to go that way and God wants to go this way. And we want to get there now, but he's taking his time. And what's happening? We're just all rough and we're raw around our neck because we've taken his yoke upon us. But the yoke is supposed to be easy. The burden is light. How many of us feel like all the different rules of discipleship are easy and light? How many of us are going to describe it that way? Most of us don't. Most of us are like, actually, this is a massive burden in my life, like every day. <laughs> Nothing easy or light about it. And yet Jesus would disagree with you. He says that it is easy and it is light. I think that our perception on this has to do with how we magnify our own personal problems. You know, I appreciate the teen ministry. Uh, Lucia shared she was baptized as a teen. And I was talking to Anna. She was saying the same thing. Um, I was also baptized in the teen ministry. Yeah. 
Although I was not a, a superstar like these guys. I was much more uh, feeble in my spiritual strength or lack thereof. In, in fact, I saw in the video, you saw like Chase uh, from Toronto get baptized. Like I, I look kind of like that a little bit. You know, that was, I saw myself in that picture there. And so I remember I became a disciple and it was, it was tough. I felt like it was tough. Now, in reality, like, I didn't really have any, like, problems nor responsibilities in my life, but it just felt difficult because I had no character. A lot of us come in the kingdom not with low character, but, like, with a deficiency of character. We have, like, negative character. Like, I was talking to someone yesterday who came to Women's Day, and I was like, are you coming to church tomorrow? She's like, I, I would love to come to church tomorrow. I was like, well, great. So you're going to be at church tomorrow? We'll see. Well, what's standing in your way? I I'm getting there. And this is someone who's come to like midweeks multiple times. They come to Devo. They came to Women's Day. But, but I don't know if I'm going to come to church. I was like, well, what would stop you? It's just 10 a.m. is so early. What? It's like well, subjective. But like, like you realize this is totally within your control, right? Like, well, I don't know. Like, I don't know what's going to happen. We'll see. I was like, well, you do know. It's like, again, entirely your decision here. I, I just want to help you understand this is not something out of your control. It's entirely in your control. But it's crazy talking to someone who, like, something's totally in their control, and they just believe it's not. Yeah. Like, they're totally a victim of their alarm clock. <laughs> like, like, my internal alarm clock will decide when I get up and where I go. It's just so interesting. And that's how a lot of us come in. And I was that, but, like, minus a thousand character points coming into the kingdom. And so, for me, everything about being a disciple was tough. Also, I was a uh, dishonest young fellow. I would lie sometimes. It's probably very hard for you guys to believe. <laughs> Brian, can you help me with my mic? It's tipping over. And so I would lie. Now I never lie. Or do I? That's, that's something a liar would say, right? But I remember I, I was telling my lies. I was good at lying. It, or so I thought. And I realized I was not good at lying. Because I got caught lying. And I remember I got into this huge blow up with my dad. And you know like when your dad's just trying to be a dad? And again, like your total deficiency of character and maturity just makes you turn into an emotional beast. And I just lashed out at my dad. And I said some hurtful things to him. And now he was composed up until then. And then he came back with a few hurtful things of his own. And I remember just walking out of that house feeling like I, I'm done. I've given up being a disciple. And it was like 1 a.m. I'm like 16. And, and I'm walking out on the street. And I remember calling a, a mentor of mine in the church. I was just telling him, I can't do it. I can't do it anymore. And he was saying, well, maybe we can pray about it. I was like, I ain't praying. I'm done praying. This is where it's gotten me. Of course, it was my sin that had gotten me there. And, and so we're on the phone, and he's praying for me. And I'm just walking down. I've been walking for a while. I no longer recognize where I am. And then this car pulls up behind me. These two guys get out of the car, and they run up to me, and they throw me like into the bushes off the sidewalk. And I get up, and one of them puts a gun right to my forehead. And I had no money. And this frustrated him. And so it, we stood there for what, it was probably like a few seconds, but it felt like a long time. And then instead he punches me in the stomach and just pushes me back in there, takes my phone, launches it across the street. They get back in their car and go. And so I'm just kind of dazed there. I go find my phone. And like my buddy Javier is still on the phone. I'm like, Jordan, hello, Jordan, are you there? And I was like, I think I can do it actually. <laughs> I think I can be a Christian. And I ran home as fast as I could. And it's crazy how all of a sudden, like the immense weight of all my just super complex and unique and complicated hardships just didn't feel as difficult anymore. Come on, bro. I think for a lot of us, when we think about the things that would stop us from being a Christian, it's just, it's just so demanding of me all the time. Church on Sunday and every other Wednesday. I'm so busy in my schedule. It's expensive. I got to wake up every morning on time. Like, who knows what time I'll wake up? We'll see. And they're telling me, no, 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 you got to like decide when you got to wake up. That's, that's it's, it's, you're asking a lot from me right there. But when you're met with your own mortality, ask yourself, is it really all that hard? Yeah. Consider Jesus says this moments before he goes to the cross to be tortured in agony and to give his life for yours. Perhaps that's why he considered all your struggles, all the hardships you would go through. And he says, it's light, light work. It's not going to be all that hard. You see, if you want to walk with God, it says you'll find rest for your souls. 
a requirement of it is you have to yoke yourself to Jesus. That means you commit yourself to going in His direction at His pace, relinquishing control of your life to Him. Not just your Savior, but your Lord as well. Come on, bro. Here, go to 2 Chronicles chapter 16. Come on, bro. I thought I'd share a little bit about my life today with you guys. Thank you, bro. We might have a series of stories here. We'll see. 2 Chronicles chapter 16. Some of you guys are checking the table of contents. It's okay. You found it. It's right after 1 Chronicles. Chapter 16, verse 9. It says, For the eyes of the Lord range throughout the earth to strengthen those whose hearts are fully committed to Him. You have done a foolish thing, and from now on you will be at war. Weird ending to that verse. Well, the context here is King Asa has, instead of relying on his consultation with God, he has put his faith, he's put his stock into his neighboring allied forces, and really he's relied on men. And here a prophet has been sent to King Asa, and he says that God's eyes range across the earth, looking to strengthen who? Those who are fully committed to him. And it says that because he did not do this, because he was not fully committed, now he will be at war forever. Now, this is noteworthy because all throughout the Old Testament, the hallmark of a righteous leader is that the result of their leadership would be an era of peace or prosperity, usually 40 years. And if you're really cranking, you would get 80 years of peace and prosperity. So in the book of Judges, we see like Gideon, he rescues the people from the Midianites. What's the result? 40 years of peace. And you see it again and again. And here, Asa is considered a righteous king. He is remembered a righteous king. And yet he will have no peace. He will have no prosperity. It says he will be at war. Because although he was somewhat committed to God, he was not fully committed to God. He did not rely on God when things got tough. He was only partially invested in his relationship with God. So he's not at peace. You know, I had a friend who wanted to get in shape. And we were talking about like how hard it is to get in shape. It's not a Mecca, but me and a Mecca have a thing going right now. He, he has taken it upon himself to be my physical trainer. And he texts me at various times throughout the day, so I got to be ready to make sure that I worked out that day. But I was talking to a different friend, and I was like, you know, it's really not that complicated, actually. You just got to get a gym membership, and they'll solve a lot of your problems. And he's like, okay, I'm going to get a gym membership. But I just feel like I, I don't like the way I look. I'm a little self-conscious about my appearance, so I want to get in better shape first. And then I'll go to the gym and get a gym membership. What? What? He's like, yeah, because I'll be in there. I'm fat. I don't want anyone to look at me funny. So I'll just kind of work on it on my own. And then once I'm like more confident about my appearance, well, then I'll make sure I start getting in the gym regularly. And of course, we hear that and we go, well, that's never going to work, dude. You don't go to the gym because you're in great shape. You go there to get in better shape, to stay in good shape. And yet this is exactly what people do with God. They say, well, I can't read my Bible, I can't pray, I can't come to church because I'm just not strong spiritually. So what I'll do is I'll become strong in my faith once I'm fully committed, then I'll start reading my Bible, then I'll start praying, then I'll start making disciples, then I'll start sharing my faith, then I'll actually come to church consistently. You don't understand. It's not that you're weak, therefore you can't do these things. It's you don't do these things, therefore you are weak. Not the other way around. If you don't actually give your heart, you're not going to get any results from what you're trying to do. You see this happen in marriage all the time. You talk to a married couple and they say, well, I've just, I've fallen out of love with this person. I just don't feel the spark anymore. At first it was so exciting and now it's become bland and I don't feel in love with this person anymore. And they misunderstand, they don't realize what they're saying. Love, yes, it is a feeling. You do feel love for people, but it is also a verb. It is an action. You do love. So you ask them, hey, when you felt all this attraction and desire for your wife, what were you doing with her? I, I was taking her on dates every weekend. I, I would get her flowers and we'd do these different activities and, and then she would make me a card and then we would make food together. We spent all this time together. I'd ask her how her day was and she would tell me we'd bond. But when's the last time you took her on a date? No, we don't go on dates. When's the last time you got her some flowers? Oh, uh, not since we were recording. Like, do you ever ask her how her day was? No, I wish she would stop talking to me. And it's like, well, and the reason why is because I don't feel love for her anymore. No, 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 you idiot. You don't feel love for her anymore because you stopped loving her. And many of us, we do this with God. We say, church just isn't the same anymore. 
It's just not how it used to be. But church didn't change. The Bible still says what it said. God is the same and he always will be the same. You are the factor. You're the one who changed. And you're waiting for this like irresistible grace just to like spring up in your heart that just drives you to read your Bible and you have no choice and you're just like driven to pray and be close to God and be committed. But it doesn't work like that. The scripture says that God... His eyes are ranging across the earth. He's looking for someone to strengthen. He wants to give you strength. You're the one not permitting him to do so because you're not committed to him. I want to challenge you guys. If you don't feel close to God, don't wonder where he went. Look at where you are. And realize that you need to go back to the things you did at first. Commit yourself to being devoted to God by reading your Bible and praying every single day this week. Not like in a checklist way, but because you desire to be close to him. Go to 2 Corinthians chapter 12. Point number one was strengthened by commitment. Point number two, strengthened in weakness. I apologize to the splash zone up here. Come on, splash zone. I was getting into it, yeah. Come on, bro. 2 Corinthians chapter 12. Read with me here in verse 7. No, halfway through. New sentence. Therefore, in order to keep me from becoming conceited, I was given... Oh, what was Paul given? He was given a gift. Let's see. I was given a thorn in my flesh, a messenger of Satan to torment me. Three times I pleaded with the Lord, take it away from me. But he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses so that Christ's power may rest on me. That is why, for Christ's sake, I delight in weaknesses, in insults, in hardships, in persecutions, in difficulties. For when I am weak, then I am strong. I've always had a problem with the end of that verse there. It's just a blatant, contradictory statement. He says he's strong when he's weak. But the whole, like, definition of these words, this cannot be so. Like, if you're weak, it's because you're not strong enough. If you're strong, it means that you are no longer weak. Paul says he's strong because he's weak. He's strong because when he's weak. And the story here is that Paul has some kind of suffering going on in his life. It's a little bit vague and ambiguous. I think the reason why is because the suffering we experience is going to vary and be different for each of us. And so Paul has this like intense suffering. He describes it as a torment from the devil. And he pleads with God, take the pain away. Please, take the suffering away. And here, Paul describes what I believe to be a very relatable experience. It's the experience of God not answering your prayer. Like sometimes I pray, God answers it, and that's like pretty faith building. When he answers it very directly, you're like, wow, God is real. That's, who knew? And yet most of the time, when you pray for something directly, I find that I don't get the thing that I'm asking for. Here, God does answer his prayer in a sense, but what is his answer? No, I'm not going to do it. I'm not going to take the suffering away. There have been many times in my life where I find myself begging God to give me strength. But in reality, I'm asking for things just to be a little easier. I want to be able to do what I'm trying to do without all the affliction and the pain that comes with it. Because what is strength? It just means it doesn't take as much to get the bar up. I just want this to be an easier experience. Come on, bro. In fact, we all have to come to the realization of a hard truth. God is not looking to make things easier for me and you. Yeah. What is his response to Paul? No, I'm not going to make it easier. It's going to be painful. He says, my grace is sufficient for you. What does that mean? The grace is not going to help him with his pain. It's not going to be a solution to remove the experience he's going through. All it means is that he's not going to save you from it, but he'll be with you while you go through it. Come on. I thought I'd share a little bit about my life with you guys today. Come on. I, uh, like I said before, was baptized just before my 14th birthday with a nice deficit of character. And, uh, I, but I was excited. I was happy. I was fearful, but I was excited about the opportunity to have a new life, to have a fresh start. And uh, I, there were hardships like what I shared about earlier, but not really. Those weren't really any kind of suffering. For me, suffering wouldn't come for about three more years. And yet for those first three years, uh, it was great. I love the community. Like I love coming to church on Sunday and singing the songs. I thought it was fun. We did a lot of like basketball devotionals in the team ministry back then. So 
that was a great time. During this time period, my younger sister, she also got baptized. She's about a year younger than me. My older brother also became a disciple, and it was great to see my family coming back together as well. And we were living in Southern California at the time. Uh, I was truly a trailblazer for the teen ministry because when I was 17, I started dating in the teen ministry, which was rare at the time. So I, I blazed a path for Christian over here. <laughs> Shout out Christian and Anna. Shout out Brian. He's working on it. Um, but, yeah, actually, I, I was 16. I was 16. This is actually not long after the whole episode with the lying. So people can change and change quickly. And so I started to grow. I loved the community. I made great friendships. And things really changed the summer between my sophomore and junior year in high school. My family was going to move from Los Angeles to the East Coast to New York. And so that's a big deal. And I was going to miss all the friendships I had built in California. But I was optimistic because we did have a church just like the one in L.A., over here in New York as well. It is an international family of churches, as you saw from the GNN. And yet one of the things that I was sad about is my best friend in California. He was like an older brother to me. He was like just out of college or finished his associates, something like that. And really he was like a mentor to me. And so I asked my parents, hey, if he's willing to come, could we bring my friend with us? And I was surprised. My parents said, yeah, he can come and he can stay with us until he finds a place that's totally okay with us. And so I asked him if he would come and he agreed and he came. And so I really felt like God was protecting me and taking care of my family as we moved to the East Coast because everything was working out in my life. I showed up, first day of basketball practice, I took the starting spot from the senior who was there. And he didn't really like me after that, but who cares? I got the starting spot. And, and things were going well. And we were there from the summer and around Thanksgiving time, uh, this close friend that I had brought with me, he was going to go back and visit his family in California for Thanksgiving just for like a week and come back. And I remember... Uh, seeing him off to the airport and to this day that was the last time I ever saw him and he goes and there's a few days over in California and his dad actually calls me after a few days he says hey like do you know what happened to him he, he came took his stuff and went and nobody knows where he is oh I'll try to call him I called him called him texted him nothing total ghost from everybody and this was really confusing for a while and so weeks months go by no one's heard from him and you just kind of move on but it was very strange. And about six, seven months later, I'll never forget coming into a room and being told that while he had been with us, he had been sexually abusing my little sister. And he had been assaulting her. And he would sneak into her room at night and he would molest her and then threaten her to not tell anyone. And I was crushed when I learned this because I didn't love anyone in the world more than I loved my little sister. And you just feel just the weight of everything coming down on you. And I remember just feeling like I lost my sanity for the first few days. And then when things come back, it's just rage and it's anger. And my first hope went into justice. And my parents took my sister to the police station and they filed a police report and she gave her testimony to them and they issued a warrant. And to this day, the warrant is out and they could not extradite for whatever reason. And I felt like we had been failed on that side. And then this anger and this hatred for this man, this disgusting, ugly human being. And then I felt hatred toward my dad because he just didn't seem angry enough to me. He was heartbroken but composed. And I felt like he wasn't mad enough about what had happened. And then I felt the hatred for myself because I felt that at some level this had to be somewhat my fault because this was my friend. How could I have not seen what he was? How could I have not seen through what was going on? And then I pointed it at God. How could you let this happen? You were supposed to be protecting my family. And now it's all falling apart. And I remember coming to this place so filled with anger and so filled with rage. And it felt like so many other things were falling apart all at the same time. And I realized that I had two choices. I was either going to spiral out embrace a life of lowered inhibitions and let this be my reason for why it's okay to be angry at God. Why I don't have to embrace his call for my life. Because this isn't fair. That was one option. I realized the other option was I was going to have to devote myself to being closer to him than I'd ever been before. On, bro. The scripture says that God's power is made perfect in weakness. Strength is shown in weakness. So what I've learned 
is that going from strength to strength doesn't just mean that you're awesome all the time. It's learning what it means to come to God even when you're broken. Yeah. Relying on Him even when it doesn't feel like you should. Come on, bro. I'm very grateful for the people that God put into my life at this time, and I think He made a perfect safety net. Today I have a great relationship with my parents, as does my sister. My sister is a disciple. In fact, she uh, serves in the ministry in our church in Dallas. And uh, she just celebrated her one-year wedding anniversary as well. And uh, she married a total golden retriever of a young man. It's like Jackie, but a man. And he's just such a happy guy. Very strange, you know, meeting him. I'm like, I'm going to put the fear of God in this guy. And I'm just talking to a Labrador. <laughs> so, but like nothing to intimidate here. He's just a Boy Scout. Um, yeah, I wonder what a sin list was. Empty, probably. I, I spent time with him. Like I haven't seen him sin before. And I'm looking with a critical eye, too. But I've seen that in this situation that I was sure would destroy my family. God took care of us through it. My sister is doing well. And she's the strongest person that I know. Come on. Go to Ezekiel 22. Come on, bro. Come on, Jordan. You see, what I've learned is that my story is actually not unique or even uncommon. The truth is, one in four women are raped or sexually assaulted in their lifetime. Almost always by a family member or close friend. In the USA, every 10 minutes someone will take their own life. We live in the information age. We have the greatest tool that's ever been created, the internet. You can learn anything and it's all at the touch of your fingers. At any given moment, about 40% of the internet is being devoted exclusively to viewing internet pornography. We have the greatest tool of all time and nearly half of it is being used at any given point to watch videos and pictures of people having sex with each other. This demand and the, what we understand about the population around us in various polls and surveys and research like this has led us to believe with accuracy that about 70% of men within the past week have spent time viewing porn on the internet. In the past year, 98%. This demand for pornographic content has created a huge surge in human trafficking. It's one of the biggest businesses in the world. Alyssa and I had the privilege of living in New Delhi, India for a little over a year. And while you're there, anytime you come to an urban district or a populated area, you'll see a flurry of young children running to you. They're trained to identify foreigners or high profile people. And they'll come to you with no shoes, running barefoot on pavement and it's 110 degrees outside. Second degree burns easily on their bodies. And they come and they beg you for money. And you're told not to give them money because they won't get to keep it. In fact, all these children are victims of the human trafficking circuit that takes place there. And anything you give them will be confiscated by their handlers. The US government estimates that at any given time, there are about 28 million people who are currently involved in the human trafficking circuit. That's the population of Boston seven times over. In Ezekiel 22, we'll look here in verse 30, but if you just scan your page, look at the verses that precede it. What you'll see is that this is not a new development. This has been the state of humanity for at least the last 2,600 years, which is how, long this book, how old this book is. If you just scan your page, you'll see that God accuses them of detestable practices. It says that they make idols and that they shed blood as they sacrifice to it. That's in reference to the gods of Molech and Baal, where they believe that if they would put their young infant children into the fire, it would make them wealthy and it would make them successful. You know, today there are many, many people in movements that say that sacrificing your unborn child for the sake of development in your, in your career is a totally acceptable thing to do. It says that they defile their families. They treat their father and mother with contempt. It says they impress foreigners and they mistreat the orphans. It says they're slanderers and liars. They commit lewd acts. It says that they violate women. They, viol their own, they violate their own daughters and daughters-in-law. It says they violate their sisters, each other's sisters. They accept bribes. They extort unjust gain. And in verse 12, he says, and you have forgotten me, declares the Lord. In verse 30, after God accuses his people of living in this, he says, I looked for someone among them who would build up the wall 
and stand before me in the gap on behalf of the land so that I would not have to destroy it. But I found no one. Here, God sees the state of humanity. And what does it say about the prophets of their day? Those who called themselves heroes for God's people. It says that they did nothing. They chose to be ordinary. They chose to believe that the scope of the problem was too big, too difficult for them to have any impact on or solve. And God is looking for anyone just to do something. You see, God wasn't looking for someone to come in and solve all the problems. He was just looking for someone to do anything. Someone who cared. Someone who was willing to contribute. Someone who was willing to rely on him. Someone who was willing to be committed to him and his cause. He finds no one. We know from history, God comes and obliterates this nation. Babylon comes and sends them into exile and thousands and thousands perish. God did not want to do it. He says that he had to because not even one person would give him a reason not to. He came and destroyed the people of that nation because they were too afraid to say something. Too lazy to do something. Maybe too busy to start trying. What is our excuse today? Can we open our eyes and see that the world we live in is exactly the same as the world described right before God destroys it? The reason why they didn't do it doesn't really matter. At the end of the day, they didn't even try. On, Turn your Bibles to 2 Timothy chapter 4. Come on, bro. Come on. Point number three, strengthened for the war for souls. Come on. Come on, bro. Come on, bro. Edmund Burke has a quote. He says, The only thing necessary for the triumph of evil is for the good men to do nothing. And it couldn't be more true than today. Because what does the world look like today? It is captive to sin. We are living in a broken and dying world. 2 Timothy chapter 4. We find a prediction of the world we live in. In verse 3, it says, For the time will come when people will not put up with sound doctrine. Instead, to suit their own desires, they will gather around them a great number of teachers to say what their itching ears want to hear. They will turn their ears away from the truth and they'll turn aside to myths. We have to understand that the greatest trick the devil ever pulled was convincing the world he doesn't exist. Wow. Yeah. How many of us just go about our days totally oblivious to the cosmic backdrop of the war for good and evil happening around us? If you're here today on a Sunday and you're dressed in a tie and you came early and you paid $5 for parking and you're listening to me going a little longer than I'm supposed to go. If this stuff isn't true, you are a fool today. C.S. Lewis has a quote. He says that Christianity, if true, infinitely important. If false, of no importance. The only thing it cannot be is moderately important. And yet, isn't that how most people treat it? It's important, but not like the most important thing in my life right now. I've got some other projects I'm working on. I'm not saying it's not important. It's just not the most important. I don't know if I can commit to a Bible study right now. It doesn't even make sense. If this is actually true, that means that there is a God who came in human form to die for your sins, to redeem you. He's called you to live like a disciple. He's called you to be a part of the kingdom. He's called you to embrace the project of the covenant of building his family. It also means that there is an adversary. Yeah. The word Satan means adversary. He's an opponent. He stands for, against whatever God stands oh, for. On. Do you not think he's also warring for your soul? Yeah. Yeah. Wow. What is his strategy? Well, Satan has declared war on the truth. Yeah. It says that there will be a great number of teachers that come and say what our itching ears want to hear. It's a fun description. You ever pet your dog like right behind the ear? Oh, yeah. How do they act? They just dissolve, don't they? Oh, yeah. and you can see it. Like you find the spot and they're like, that's the spot. And they just roll over and show you their belly as fast as they can. That's like scratching a nice little itch. That's how God says we react to the pleasure of false doctrine. Just tell me I don't have to be all. Just tell me like every other Sunday. Just, just, just. Oh, yeah, yeah. I don't have to repent. One moment of sincerity is all I need. All I got to do is just have this moment of acceptance in summer camp in seventh grade. And I'm good to go. And once I go, I say, I love it, man. Give me more of that. We live in a capitalistic society. Capitalism is predicated on the idea that if enough people want something, someone is going to come along and sell it to them. And man, religion is a big business. 
And man, we want it in every way we can. It's Burger King, baby. Have it your way. I want my religion. Hold the pickles. Show me extra cheese. Give me a little bit of church on Sunday. Not too much here. Don't talk about money. Don't talk about the cross. Avoid these topics. That's sensitive for me. And show me this one and show me that one and read this scripture, but don't read that one and give me this, but don't give me that. That's not how it works, man. And you can find a preacher that'll say your exact flavor as long as there's enough other consumers to buy it. And yet the Bible predicts that this would happen. That there would be preachers who come and they'll get rich and some will succeed and some won't. But what are they doing? They are agents of Satan who are part of the war on the truth. And why? It says the reason why is people just don't want to put up with sound doctrine. They see the scripture and they're like, I'm just not trying to deal with that right now. I'm going through a lot. My stocks are doing bad. The economy, it's a recession. Like sound like just another time. But we can't have the stomach to say, I'm going to reject God right now. Just, just give me a version of God that's just a little bit more palatable right now. Yeah. There's a war on the truth. So what is the truth? We'll go to John chapter 3. Come on, bro. Come on, babe. This is awesome, bro. I just want to show you in three verses Preach. a concept that will be contradicted nowhere. In John chapter 3, in verse 1, it says, Now there was a Pharisee, a man named Nicodemus, who was a member of the Jewish ruling council. He came to Jesus at night and said, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher who has come from God, for no one could perform the signs you are doing if God were not with him. Now that's incredible. You have a Pharisee. These are the enemies of God. He comes at night. He's Nick. He's Nick at night. He's Nick at night. And he comes to Jesus and he says, hey, we, speaking on behalf of who? The Pharisees, the ones who killed Jesus. He says, we know that you're from God because look at what you're doing, man. No, we can't do that. What's he referring to? The miracles. Mm -hmm. He sees the miracles. He says, we know you're from God. Yeah. He condemns all of them right there at the beginning of the story. Jesus replies, verse 3. Jesus replied, very truly I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God unless they are born again. How can someone be born when they are old, Nicodemus asked. Surely they cannot enter a second time into their mother's womb to be born. Is he confused? I think he'd rather be confused than accept what Jesus is saying. Yeah. It's cognitive dissonance. We do this. We're so great at cognitive dissonance. Like you ever go to a toddler and you tell them to clean their room? What's their first defense? Why? 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 And then you tell them like, shut up and clean your room. What's the next defense when they realize dialogue is not going to help them? Confusion. It's confusing. Like, what do you mean clean my room? I, 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 I don't even get it. I don't even understand. Like, it just makes no sense. I don't even know. Like, you ever, like, like, you're interrogating someone and they know that they're guilty and what do they keep hitting you with? I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. Like, like do you think you're really doing your best here? I don't know. Like, do you know anything? I, I don't know. <laughs> it's cognitive dissonance. We do this all the time. It's when we have two ideas that are not consistent, we will bend and break our minds to make them consistent in any way that we can. Psychotic breaks are not just for, like, serial killers on Netflix. We psychotic break ourselves in doing things. We, I do it every time I pay for gas. I just, I, I just take the two inconsistent concepts, and Brian didn't give me gas money for Devo, and I, I just, I, I, I just, I, I, I embrace psychosis for the sake of peace in my mind, and I, and I pay for the gas. We do this all the time with our false doctrine. We know it doesn't make sense. Like we know there's like blatant fallacies and flaws in our doctrine, but I'll take it because it's not disrupting too much that I got going on right now. Wow. This language, verse 5, he says, Very truly I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless they are born of water and spirit. Does it seem like a suggestion or a re recommendation here? No, no. It doesn't seem like it to me. I could be wrong. But he uses words like, you must, you cannot, unless. And yet, how many of us come from places where it's like, baptism, we're not against it. I mean, it's a good idea. We're not like, certainly not opposed to it. We're just saying that you don't have to. Well, Jesus says that you do. <laughs> like, I'll take his word over yours. We see an example of it in Acts chapter 2. Help us out, bro. Come on, bro. Come on, babe. Acts chapter 2, we see a point blank example of it taking place. Verse 36, Peter says, Therefore, let all Israel be assured of this God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Messiah. Now, that's the doctrine right there. Jesus was God, and you killed him with your sin. Verse 37 When the people heard this, they were cut to the heart. And they said to Peter and the other apostles, Brothers, what shall we do? They get it. They're humble. They say, okay, what do we do? Peter doesn't tell any riddles. Verse 38. Peter replied, repent and be baptized, every one of you, 
in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. That part's not a mystery either. It also comes at baptism. What's the, the teaching here? You have to believe, you have to repent, and then you have to get baptized. And then if you keep reading, it says those who accept the message do exactly that. And why is Peter preaching this? He's just saying exactly what Jesus told him to say in Matthew chapter 28. Please turn with me there. Come on. The earth has been given to me. Me? No, Jesus. Jesus said this. It's been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. Jesus says to do three things. You make him into a disciple. Then what? Baptize. And then what? Teach them to it. Wait, whoa, whoa, whoa. So I can't just be a disciple and get baptized and call it a day? No. You have to actually obey every single day after that. What is the whole truth? It's actually very simple. You have to have faith. If you don't believe in this stuff, what are we even talking about? You have to have faith. You have to repent and be a disciple. You got to get baptized. That's when your sins are washed away. It washed away. It doesn't just make sense. And then you have to actually be faithful to the commands of God. You can't just go and live totally differently right afterwards. You have to actually be faithful. Doesn't that make sense? Yeah. Like when you want to get married to someone, what do you have to do? First, you have to get them to agree to marry you. And then you got to have a wedding. Are you married a day before your wedding? No, you're definitely not. What about a day after? Like you completely are. You can't get out of it. And yet, if your spouse just divorces you and abandons you, are you still married? Like, like would, you, would you be concerned about your friend? If like their wife divorced them, abandoned them, and married someone else, and they're like, yeah, it's my wife though, it's still my wife. Here, I'm coming over to their house right now. It's like, brother, you gotta move on. That's not, that's not what's happening here. When you don't live faithfully to God's commands, what'd you do? You handed in your certificate of divorce. And you walked out and you started a new life with someone else. He probably thinks it's kind of weird when you just walk in for like, what's for dinner? You divorced me. Ah, you see the best in me. I see everything about you, including the divorce. What are you talking about here? It's actually very simple. So why do people reject such a simple teaching? Well, it just doesn't really meet the itch. <laughs> this doesn't really hit that fuzzy spot. In fact, it feels heavy. It feels like a weight. And yet, if you do it with Jesus, he says it'll be light and not burdensome. Go to Acts chapter 20. You see, Satan has declared war on the truth. He's also declared war on the church. Acts chapter 20. And again, these things are not just like observations we have when we made this stuff up. Paul predicted there would be an assault on the truth. Here he predicts there will be an assault on the church. Acts 20 verse 27. I have not hesitated to proclaim to you the whole will of God. Neither have I. I just told you the whole thing. It's like not that much stuff. You got to believe, have faith, repent, be baptized, and then stay faithful. That's the whole will of God. Keep watch over yourselves and all of the flock of which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers. Be shepherds of the church of God, which he bought with his own blood. I know that after I leave, savage wolves will come in among you, and they will not spare the flock. Even from your own number, men will arise and distort the truth in order to draw away disciples after them. That's a scary prophecy right there. Paul says that Satan is going to not only declare war on the truth, he's going to attack the church. Hasn't the whole concept of church just been like totally attacked by Satan? You ever invite someone to church and they hit you with the, sorry, I don't believe in organized religion. Yeah. You're like, what do you believe in then? Like disorganized religion? What's the alternative to organization? Like, what are you talking about here? Like, imagine, like, they don't understand what the church is. The church is not a building. Like, sometimes you say, oh yeah, that's a church. We don't meet in a church. The church is not a building. Church is also not an event. We say, oh, I'm going to church. Church starts at 10 a.m. Church is not a building. It's not an event. It's a group. It's a group of people who have decided that they're really going to live like Christians. Yeah. Anywhere you got a group of people who decide they're really going to live like Christians, you got the church right there with you. Right. That's what Satan's trying to attack. Why? Because this is where we survive as disciples. This is also God's vehicle for how he fights back against the darkness. Right. If you were Satan, wouldn't you want to immobilize that thing? The thing that's fighting against you? Yeah. That's exactly what he does. Like imagine I want to sign up for the military. I want to be a Marine. Right. And I say, I want to fight for my country. And the recruiter, they're always looking for people. Like, oh yeah, sign right here. We'll get you in. We'll get you a Camaro, everything. And okay, I want to fight for my country. They say, okay, we'll get you a drill sergeant. We'll take you to base camp, we'll boot camp, and we'll do some training, and we'll put, get you in a squad, all this stuff. We'll deploy you. And imagine the guy goes, well, I just don't believe in organized combat. So I think what I'm going to do is I'm just going to book my own one-way ticket to the battle, 
and you'll see me there, and you'll be doing your thing, I'll be doing my thing, and we're on the same side. And I'll, I'll have my gun, you'll have yours, and we're fighting the bad guys, and freedom for America, baby. I'll take my uniform. Like, are you going to be a part of the Marines like that? No. no, that makes no sense. That's crazy. Like, like, if we see you there, we better not. We'll, we'll attack you. You're a liability on the field out there. That's exactly what we do with God. Like, yeah, I, I want to be part of the army of God. I just don't want nobody telling me what to do. I don't want no accountability. I want to do it on my time, on my way, and I'll just go there. We're doing the same thing. We're fighting for the same side, and we're helping each other out, and I'm helping you, and you're doing it on different sides of the Jordan. You're not fighting for us at all, buddy. You're an enemy of God. Because you don't want to take his yoke upon your life. See, Satan will attack from the outside. He'll attack from the inside. He's attacking everywhere. What does our resolution need to be? Commit yourself to being close to God. Fully commit yourself to the Lord. Go to Joshua chapter 24. Right now, the only thing standing between you and your lunch is me. Thank you, bro. And it's an honor. Come on. You can... Beg God to take that away. He'll say, my grace is sufficient. Listen to the whole lesson. Joshua 24, in verse 14. We find God's people are in this very situation. 24, verse 14. Joshua says, Now fear the Lord and serve Him with all faithfulness. Throw away the gods your ancestors worshipped beyond the Euphrates River and in Egypt and serve the Lord. But if serving the Lord seems undesirable to you, then choose for yourself today whom you will serve. Whether the gods of your ancestors serve beyond the Euphrates or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you are living, but as for me and for my house, we will serve the Lord. Here he says, just no more wavering in the valley of decision. I think a lot of us, we just got one foot in and one foot out, and it's just agonizing. Because you want to be a disciple, but you don't want to make more disciples. And you want to be a Christian, but you don't want to be totally pure. And you want to be a part of it, but you don't want to be responsible for moving it. And it's just agony every single day. And you wake up not sure if you're going to have your quiet time. You wake up not sure if you're really going to deny yourself that day. And it's just this mental battle. And you're just getting ragdolled by Satan, tossed back and forth by the wind. Haven't you had enough? Have you had enough? At some point, you just got to say, I'm really going to do this for real this time. And I appreciate Joshua does not force anything on anyone. He says, if it's not desirable to you, then just go do something else, man. Yeah. No one's making you live here. You got gods over there. You got gods over here. Just don't be on this side of the river if you're going to be doing all that stuff. And so for us today, if we just keep finding ourselves looking in the rearview mirror and just like, man, in the world, I just had it going on. Everybody liked me and nobody likes me here. And I had my thing and, and I had this success and now I don't have it. And if the world just seems so desirable to you, then just go live in it. And when it's taken your dignity, and when it's stolen your purity, and when it's taken your confidence and left you with nothing, then just come back and be committed to God this time. Not committed to some type of three or four letter acronym organization. It's temporary. Not committed to your desire to be in the ministry one day. Not committed to the desire for a godly spouse. Not committed for an easier life. You have to actually be committed to walking with God. If your commitment is in anything else, it will be exposed when you fall away. Wow. We'll close out in Matthew chapter 7. Come on, and we'll close out here. On, bro. We have to be committed to our walk with God. Not institutions. Not organizations. Just God and His kingdom. Yeah. To God and to each other. Come on. Matthew 7 verse 24. Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who put his house, built his house on the rock. The rain came down, the streams rose, and the wind blew and beat against that house, yet it did not fall because it had its foundation on the rock. But everyone who hears these words of mine and does not put them into practice is like a foolish man who built his house on sand. The rain came down, the streams rose, and the wind blew and beat against that house, and it fell with a great crash." Why are we talking about being committed to God today? Why does it matter if we're strengthened in weakness? What does it matter if we're strengthened for the war for souls? What does that mean? Is this Star Wars? What is that? What are you even talking about? Guys, it's life or death for your salvation. Yeah. It says that, he, he really puts it in two categories. Everyone hears the word. He says, some of you guys are going to do it, and some of you guys just won't. 
How do you go from strength to strength? Being strong has nothing to do with how tough you think you are. Or, or how much abrasiveness you think you can put off. Yeah. It has to do with what is the strength of the foundation that you're building on. Yeah. If you're built on the rock, on Jesus, you're strong. You'll go from strength of the rock to the strength of God in heaven. But if you're built on the sand, there's no strength there, and you'll be exposed when trouble comes. What does it mean to actually build your house on the rock? It's as simple as putting the words of Jesus into practice. That's the only question we have today. The question isn't, are you going to be strong? The question isn't, like, am I going to be like really devoted in your own subjective, ambiguous sense of the word? The question is simply, are you going to actually obey the Bible this time? Yeah. Are you going to choose to apply the Bible to your life, or are you going to ignore it and build up your house on the stand? Today, I want to challenge you. Be strengthened by commitment. Decide to be committed so that God can strengthen you. Be strengthened in your weakness, which means that when you're broken and you're beaten down, you're perfect for God to use you. Come to Him and find strength in Him. And then be strengthened for the war for souls. Use the strength that God has given you to pour that strength into someone else. Thank you. That's the lesson.